So I'm going to give just a tiny bit of pharmacology because I don't know how many people in here are pharmacologists, maybe a lot, not a lot. Uh, how, how did we study psychedelics without uh, using humans when I was at Purdue University? And what are the receptor targets? Most of you know that, but I'll talk about it briefly. And <clears throat> as I was doing this talk, I had my talk finished, and I thought, you know, there's nobody at this conference that's talking about research chemicals. And a large number of people these days are getting their first exposure to a psychedelic or an intactogen through a research chemical. So what I did is I changed the whole back end of my presentation to talk a little bit about research chemicals because a lot of people don't know what they are. Sadly, a large number of them were pilfered from my publications, so I feel a little responsible for the fact they're out there. <clears throat> and then uh, I should talk a little bit about if you want to be a researcher, what should you do, and that's part of the CME uh, requirement. So inform patients about new research refer patients to clinical studies, develop strategies for conducting research and evaluate research. I'm going to touch on some of these, but obviously this, a talk like that would be a two-hour talk in depth, so uh, I won't spend a lot of time. I do want to point out that the sort of revolution in neuroscience was catalyzed by the discovery of LSD and then a few years later the finding that serotonin was in the brain, and I think earlier somebody pointed out, maybe it was Rick, that prior to the discovery of LSD and the discovery of serotonin in the brain, psychiatric disorders were thought to be due to poor parenting. So you had mothers that were called refrigerator mothers because they had a child with schizophrenia, and they would say, well, that's some mother's fault. She didn't nurture the child properly. So there's no connection. So when they discovered that uh, LSD had effects and that serotonin was in the brain, and the recognition that there was this similarity in the skeletal fragment of LSD and serotonin, a number of people put together the idea, well, maybe behavior and mental function is somehow related to neurochemistry. And that seems sort of silly today because it's an obvious thing. But back then, they thought the brain was just sort of an electrical box and nothing about the neurochemistry had anything to do with behavior. Kind of weird thinking, but that's the way it was. <clears throat> and uh, the other thing to point out about psychedelics, and I used to use this definition a lot because you try to tell people what psychedelics were, and Jaffe was, had wrote a chapter in Goodman and Gilman, which was the pharmacologist Bible. And I like this definition because he said, psychedelics, the, the feature that distinguishes them from other classes of drugs is their capacity reliably to induce or compel states of altered perception, thought, and feeling that are not or cannot be experienced otherwise except in dreams or at times of religious exaltation. And I often give a seminar to pharmacology departments and medical schools where I give this definition. And I say, do you know of any other pharmacological class that has a definition like that? A drug that produces religious experiences. So they're a unique class, and I'm preaching to the choir. You all know that. But just to mention that before we start. <clears throat> um, these, this is a list of uh, what I'll call recently published clinical studies that have come out. And I probably don't have everything listed here that's uh, been published, but the point of the slide is what I want you to notice is the coloring. So these purple ones are all in the 1990s. These red ones are in the 2000, up to 2010, and then 2010. And what you see is this almost exponential explosion of published studies that relate to clinical research on psychedelics. And I think this trend is likely to continue. So this is really an exciting trend. And it's really obvious when you look at these numbers the literature in the field is exploding, so we're having an impact. The key brain receptors for psychedelics are the serotonin 2A and serotonin 2C receptors, and for tryptamines, they also activate the 1A receptor. LSD is a, LSD is a little bit different. Uh, somebody have a question? LSD is a little bit different because it hits lots of different receptors. And people used to say that LSD was a promiscuous drug pharmacologically, and then they switched over and they started saying, well, it had rich pharmacology. <clears throat> but from uh, the point of view of understanding how they work, if all these drugs, these types of compounds, are considered to have a similar action in the brain, it's pretty obvious that the serotonin 2A and 2C receptors are probably the ones that are most important. Things like DOM, DOB, 2CB, the kinds of things you hear about a lot on the street, activate principally the serotonin 2A receptor. They may not fully activate it, but they have a high efficacy. So they, 
produce a good activation of the receptor. We don't know much about the serotonin 1A receptor. It may be important in distinguishing the effects of the tryptamines from the phenethylamines. And with LSD, it's uh, uniquely potent, so it's doing more than just activating those two receptors. And that's one of the quests that I've been on for a long time and will continue to work on is to try to understand why LSD has such profound effects when if you look at its receptor effects at the 2A or 2C or even the 1A receptors, there's no evidence that it should be as potent in humans as it actually is. So it, it has unique pharmacology. <clears throat> so what happens inside the brain cell when we activate these receptors? This is just a model of a brain synapse. But principally, these serotonin 2A receptors are located postsynaptically. So we have a release of serotonin in the normal brain. It comes out of these vesicles and interacts with the receptors. So LSD or the other psychedelics will bind to these receptors and then induce signaling within the receptor or within the cell. And they can induce signaling in a number of ways. They can either fully activate the receptor. That's what serotonin does. LSD doesn't fully activate it. It's actually a fairly weak agonist. So if we looked at LSD on this scheme, it would probably be over here about 30% of the full activation. So not only does LSD not have the kind of receptor affinity or stick to it in this that we might expect from such a potent compound, but it also doesn't activate the receptor fully. So this may be related to its mechanism of action. And then antagonists, which don't do anything. And BOL, as you just heard in the previous talk, is currently thought to be either an antagonist or an inverse agonist. An inverse agonist actually drops the basal level below this. So BOL would, be, would fit into the scheme there. <clears throat> what happens when a psychedelic binds to the receptor? These receptors are uh, bundles of alpha helical protein pieces that are fit together in the membrane of the cell. And when the drug interacts with the exterior part of this uh, receptor, it binds inside an area that's in between what's called helices 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 to some extent. It causes the shape of this protein bundle to change. And when the shape of that bundle changes, there are pieces of the protein that stick down into the cell, and they also change. So as the receptor changes, the interior pieces of the protein of the receptor also change. And when those pieces change, they allow it to couple to signaling molecules within the cell. Now, years ago, pharmacologists used to talk about a drug that was an agonist that would activate the receptor or not activate it. And they always thought that the receptor was sort of like a switch. You turn it on and turn it off, and the signal's produced. Now, today, there's a concept in pharmacology called functional selectivity, which means that all drugs don't do the same thing to the receptor. So imagine serotonin, which is the natural transmitter, binding down inside the receptor. It causes the shape of the receptor to change in a specific way. And now we have an ensemble, the serotonin inside the receptor. And that ensemble produces a change in the pieces of the receptor that are inside the cell that allow it to couple to some set of signaling molecules. If we put LSD in there, or 2CB, or you name your favorite drug, when the receptor binds, it doesn't go to the same shape that it had when serotonin bound because it's a different molecule. So this new receptor shape induces new, new changes in the interior part of the receptor, and it no longer binds the same way to the same set of signaling molecules that serotonin bound to. So we have the possibility of coupling to a lot of different things. So we have what are called uh, G proteins, those are what normally couple to a G-protein uh, coupled receptor. And we have uh, G-alpha-I, which generally inhibits uh, cellular activity. G-alpha-S, which typically stimulates cellular activity. There's another series of G-proteins called G-alpha-Q that I don't have shown here that typically also activate the cell. It can also be phosphorylated with an enzyme that puts uh, phosphate groups onto uh, serines inside those pieces of the receptor. And that can allow them to interact with another signaling molecule called arrestin, beta arrestin. So there are a number of these signaling pathways that can be activated. So when a drug binds to a receptor and activates it, it just doesn't turn it on and off like a light switch. It turns it on and it induces a certain set of signals inside the cell. A different drug produces a different set of signals. And yet a third drug will produce even a different set of signals. So we have the complexity of understanding how psychedelics work because 
they don't just turn the receptor on and off. They induce a whole bunch of different kinds of changes. And those changes are related to the structure of the drug itself. So how does a receptor signal change consciousness? <clears throat> so this is where the hand waving comes in. Um, Franz Vollenweider uh, will give a talk, I think, tomorrow. And uh, Robin Carhart Harris will also talk about some of the newer technologies involved in looking at how the brain actually responds to psilocybin or to other psychoactive drugs. Uh, the kinds of electrical changes as measured by uh, EEG or glucose utilization as measured by PET. Uh, and there are a number of other techniques. So what happens? Well, basically, uh, we don't know clearly, but one of the things we do know is that the serotonin 2A receptor, which is the essential receptor for producing the effects of psychedelics, is highly expressed in all of the structures in the brain that are involved in perception and consciousness. So if we look at the top of the brain stem, lower midbrain, we have the locus ceruleus, which sends norepinephrine projections to the whole forebrain. We have the raphe nuclei, the dorsal raphe. It's also in the same area of the brain stem. It sends serotonin projections to the whole forebrain. We have the ventral tegmental area, which also has serotonin 2A receptors. We have serotonin 2A receptors both in the thalamus, but in particularly in the reticular nucleus. And the reticular nucleus wraps around the thalamus. So the thalamus has nuclei that are involved in processing all the senses. So auditory, vision, uh, sensing, touch, all of that is processed through the thalamus, and those signals are sent onto the cortex for final sort of processing and integration. Well, the reticular nucleus wraps around the thalamus as a single layer and sends inhibitory projections down into the thalamus and tells the thalamus which kinds of information that it should let through. So we have serotonin 2A receptors there, and we have serotonin 2A receptors located on the apical dendrites of these cortical cells, which are the main processing units in the cortex. The cortex is where we put together our picture of the world. It's where we make our executive decisions, where we do abstract thinking. So the cortex is critical to the function of higher consciousness. It's critical to defining who we are, it's critical to defining whether we're conscious, unconscious, and its activity is determined by all of these other areas. So any sensory information that comes in is filtered through the thalamus. That's regulated by the reticular nucleus. We have the raphe sending signals to the cort cortex, to the apical dendrites. We have the locus ceruleus producing norepinephrine. There are alpha receptors that respond to norepinephrine located on these pyramidal cells. And the ventral tegmental area produces dopamine and also produces activation. So the confluence of all of these things onto these sensitive processing units will change the way we perceive things. It changes the whole process of sensory perception and consciousness. So it's not surprising that something that activates serotonin 2A receptors or interacts with 2A receptors will change the way we see and experience because that's a fundamental receptor in the brain in all these areas. The serotonin 2A receptor or the serotonin 2 receptor, its progenitor, is probably one of the oldest receptors known. And the serotonin as a transmitter is thought to be phylogenetically probably the oldest of the monomine transmitters that we consider serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Because you find serotonin 2 receptors even in single-celled organisms like paramecium where it's responsible for the movement of the cells. So you know when nature finds something that works, like the serotonin 2 receptor, it continues to use it and exploit it in new ways. And as it turns out, it exploited it in modulating our perception and consciousness. <clears throat> One of the problems I had at Purdue University, working in a pharmacy school in the Midwest, um, I had lots of students who would come and volunteer to be a subject in my experiments. And I would say, well, I can't really do that. I can't even talk about anything I may or may not have done. I plead the Fifth Amendment. So how did we actually do our studies? We spent a lot of time looking at animal models, trying to find something that would parallel the activity in animals that we saw in humans. <clears throat> no animal can model what happens in humans, though. There's no animal model that can tell you, you know, I had a mystical experience, or I, you know, I remembered my childhood, or anything like that. It's a real problem. And it turns out in pharmacology, the whole subject of pharmacology is the study of the action of drugs. And if you want to understand how a system in the body works, you apply a drug that modifies that system. So for example, 
we know there are beta-1 adrenergic receptors in the heart. So if we want to know what beta-1 receptors are doing there, we can give the organism a drug that stimulates beta-1 receptors. And if we do that, we find out that beta-1 receptors can control heart rate. Give a, give a beta-1 agonist to a human, their heart will start beating faster. Um, in the fight or flight response, if you hear a noise at night, you're walking down a dark street, and you hear somebody say, hey, hippie, what are you doing down here? What happens? Your heart starts beating. And you start going, <laughs> that's epinephrine produced by adrenals, and it stimulates beta-1 receptors in the heart. So similarly, we can argue to study consciousness, we can use agents that perturb consciousness. So psychedelics, they're the best drugs to look at consciousness and how we can perturb it. I like to use this slide. but I don't hear the sound that goes with it. So if you could hear this, this would be playing uh, Grace Slick singing white, the White Rabbit, right? Anyway, the ones that Mother gives you don't do anything at all, but the ones that Sasha gives you will probably have some effect. <clears throat> we use the technique called drug discrimination, the two-lever drug discrimination, and it actually is a pretty good model uh, for what these drugs do. We have an operant chamber that has two levers in the front, and we can train the rats to press one lever or the other. So if we give a rat a drug, an LSD in this case, what we can do is turn on the right lever, and this is a trough that delivers 50 milligram uh, sucrose pellets, so it's rat candy. And we put the rat in the box, and we turn this lever on, and he'll explore the box and learn that if he presses the, this lever, he starts getting a food pellet. If he presses the left lever, nothing happens. We turn it off. The next day we put the rat in, we turn on the left lever, lever, left lever and we give him nothing, placebo, and <clears throat> he presses the right lever, nothing happens. He presses the left lever, he gets food pellets. The next day we give him LSD, put him back in, we turn on the right lever, we give him food pellets if he presses the right lever. It takes about two to three months to train rats to do this, but once you do, the rat will recognize very reliably the effect of a drug like LSD. And when you train rats, and they're really well trained, they'll press to get a food pellet anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 times in a 15-minute training session. So they're really pressing that lever. <clears throat> and the way it works is there's something unique about this called the third state hypothesis. If you now give the drug some other drug, or now give the rat some other drug like amphetamine or MDMA, and he's been trained with LSD, he won't respond on the LSD lever. He'll respond on the non-drug lever. So they uniquely recognize the drug they were trained with. So if we give this rat a drug that we've made that we think might have activity like LSD, and we've trained him on the right lever, he presses the right, le right, the right lever. He's telling us, I think you gave me LSD. And if he doesn't press it, or he presses the left lever, he's saying, I don't think he gave it to me. So we always tested our compounds after we started using this in about 1984. We tested our compounds with drug discrimination, and it actually is a fairly good assay. Um, this is just a correlation that I put together some years ago where we look at the relative potency uh, compared with LSD in rats and relative potency compared to LSD in humans. And the numbers aren't exact, but you see, here's the ethyl a compound we made, which is uh, somewhat more potent than LSD in humans. It's also more potent in rats. About, we have a relative potency of 185, which is somewhat exaggerated uh, compared to its actual potency, which is around 140 times LSD. Uh, LSD is 100, um, DOB 2.37, uh, DOI 9.26, uh, Silicin uh, 2.61, uh, MDMA 2.4.4, Mescaline 0 0.06, 0 0.04. So there's a good general correlation. This assay works well but will sometimes give you false positives. So it'll tell you something is active when, in fact, in humans it may not be active. But it was the mainstay of all the biological work in animals that we did, and it served us well. Now I'm going to talk about um, a compound that we worked with some time ago, which some of you may have heard of called 25i n bom That's an extremely potent compound. There actually have been a couple of deaths from overdose. Uh, this stuff, the dose of it is about... 500 micrograms, 200 to 500 micrograms, and people have gotten hold of the pure powder and insufflated up their nose and died. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how we did work with this before it actually uh, came out as a so-called research chemical. 
A German fellow named Rolf Heim had published that these compounds with an N-benzyl were very potent, and we were interested into whether they would have actually psychedelic type effects. So here's a compound called uh, 2,5-dimethoxyphenethylamine. Uh, it's basically inactive in humans, but we used it as a model for early studies. This is the affinity, which is how tightly it sticks to the receptor. So 380 nanomolar is not a particularly potent compound. If you put an N-methyl on this compound, you see it gets even worse. It goes up to 1,900. It's even less effective in binding. And an N-propyl, which is even larger, has about comparable decreased affinity. So if you put something onto the nitrogen of these phenethylamines, generally it ruins their activity. If you take DOB and put a methyl on it, almost kills the activity. 2CB, put a methyl on, almost kills the activity. By contrast, when you put an N-benzyl on, the affinity goes from 380 to 68 nanomolar. And if you put a methoxy over here, it goes down to 2.8 nanomolar. So this is really curious. You hook things onto the nitrogen, the activity goes down, way down. But if you uniquely put on a benzyl or a methoxy benzyl, it goes up. And this compound with an iodo is the 2,5-I N-bome. And the affinity in that case is 0 0.04 nanomolar. So it's a super potent compound. <clears throat> so we did a lot of work trying to model the receptor. And our earliest work was with an activated model of rhodopsin, which we converted into a serotonin 2A receptor. And this is uh, something that just came out. In March of 2013, the crystal structure of the human serotonin 2B receptor was published. Uh, this shows it with ergotamine bound, which is the way it was crystallized. And we've now converted that into a homology model. This is a serotonin 2A receptor, and this is LSD bound. So we now have a very good receptor model to go in and look at what these things actually do. <clears throat> so early on, uh, after doing some virtual computer docking with this N-benzyl compound, it appeared to us that the N-benzyl, which is right here, so this thing that's uh, in spheres is the N-benzyl compound. And these things that are labeled here are the residues that are in the active site, the binding site of the serotonin 2A receptor. And when we docked it in virtually, we saw that this N-benzyl group appeared to be interacting with phenylalanine 339 as a kind of edge-to-face interaction. So we thought, well, let's mutate all those residues and see if that assumption or that hypothesis is true. <clears throat> so we mutated that phenylalanine to a leucine. So phenylalanine is like a benzene ring. It's aromatic. Leucine is just a series of aliphatic carbon atoms. So you lose the aromatic character, which is necessary for these rings to stack if it binds in the receptor. But it still keeps some hydrophobicity. So when we looked at the mutated receptor where that phenylalanine was mutated, now we put those compounds in, we saw the affinity drop from 380 to 4200. So about a tenfold drop in affinity, a four, about a fivefold drop in affinity, and in this case, a sixfold drop in affinity. So that didn't tell us anything, but when we looked at the N-benzyl, you see when we did the same mutation, we got a 40-fold loss in affinity and a Fifth, a 500-fold loss in affinity with the methoxy phenyl. So this was strong evidence that that residue, phenylalanine-339, was interacting with the N-benzyl group. Uh, we, with our new model now, we're trying to dock these compounds in and get a better idea of exactly how they're fitting into the receptor. <clears throat> One of the other things we did, though, was to try to discover what shape that molecule might have when it bound to the serotonin 2A receptor. So we made a whole series of compounds. So here's a compound called 2CB. Its affinity is six, about 6 nanomolar in this series of experiments. And here's the N-methoxy benzyl 2CB, about 0.2 nanomolar. So you can see the increase in potency, 6 down to 0.2. So we used this as a model because the bromine atom was easier to get on than the iodine. So we made most of our compounds with bromine. And I had a fairly large group of students, so I assigned each student one of these molecules. So I said, let's make all the possible combinations of that 2CB with the N-benzyl group attached. So in each one of these, although it's not immediately obvious, they all have the equivalent of an N-benzyl. So here's the 2CB nitrogen, and here's the N-benzyl. Here's the 2CB nitrogen with the N-benzyl. Here's the 2CB nitrogen, and the N-benzyl is over here. Here's the N-benzyl down here. This one is a little harder to see. 2CB is here, and here's the N-benzyl. 2CB is here with the N-benzyl. And then this one substituted. This is a cis, so these are on the same side of the ring. And this is trans, they're on the opposite side of the ring. 
and the affinities here for this compound were 2.6 nanomore. We actually crystallized this into its stereoisomers. This is a pure stereoisomer, and this is the one that's most active. So although we don't strike the 0.2 nanomore affinity, if you look at these 70, 2000, 160, 170, 300, 800, 800, 2.8, we're pretty sure that that represents the shape that these n-benzo compounds maintain when they bind to the receptor. So we're doing docking studies now to see how that fits into the receptor to get a better understanding of how this superpotent compound can activate the receptor. <clears throat> so what I did when I changed my talk was to cut out the back end and talk about research chemicals. And I don't think anybody here at this conference is talking about research chemicals, so I thought this is a topic that we should really spend some time on because a lot of people are taking these. They don't know what they are, don't know where they came from, and many young people, their first experience with a psychedelic-type compound is one of these research chemicals. <clears throat> and there are several kinds of research chemicals we could talk about. The psychedelics or entheogens, the psychostimulants that are like amphetamine, or intactogens, or in pathogens, depending on which you prefer, synthetic cannabinoids, and I'll briefly talk about those, and ketamine analogs, there are one or two of those out there. I'm not going to spend time on those, but there is a methoxy substitute ketamine analog uh, that's out there that people seem to uh, be using quite a bit. Also, I'd point out that this paper just came out. I just got it for review uh, a week ago, showing that uh, lifetime use of psychedelics in the U.S. population in 2010 is over 30 million people. And that includes uh, LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, and a lot of other things that uh, were not classified. So there's a large number of people that are using these. So psychedelics or hallucinogens, we know they're characterized by changes in perception, thought, feeling, distortion of visual space, feelings of portentousness, something important is about to happen, uh, high doses can elicit anxiety or psychotic behavior. Uh, and generally, they have low toxicity and non-addictive. Now, the peculiar thing about the 25i N-bone compounds and some of the newer ones is they have killed people. There are no overdose deaths from LSD, mescaline, or psilocybin. But some of these newer so-called research chemicals do have toxic properties that are not fully appreciated. The psychostimulants are related to amphetamine. They produce elation and euphoria, give you a lot of energy, but their chronic use or large doses can produce depression and fatigue, dependence, and uh, continued use can produce uh, acute psychosis, amphetamine psychosis. And most uh, psychostimulants have cardiovascular effects. They release norepinephrine into the circulation, and that causes blood vessel constriction, and that's a major toxic problem with some of the research chemicals. <clears throat> And intactogens also produce elation and euphoria, depending on the dose and their pharmacology. Uh, large doses uh, or chronic use can produce depression and fatigue, and high doses can also produce a psychotic behavior. Uh, if people repeatedly use large doses over a short period of time. Most of these also have cardiovascular side effects because they release norepinephrine and cause vasoconstriction. These are different from the psychostimulants, the pure amphetamine, and in the beginning, when MDMA was first brought out and there was a lot of publicity, there were drug abuse experts that said, well, MDMA is just another methamphetamine. We all know today that MDMA is not just another amphetamine or methamphetamine. And we did a number of experiments in the early days to prove that MDMA was not just another amphetamine or methamphetamine. We also proved it wasn't another psychedelic amphetamine, that it had a specific category and many of you know that I created this name in tactogens to set them off as a specific class of drugs so they wouldn't be lumped into the hallucinogenic amphetamine class. They are different. I collaborated with a fellow in Germany named Wilfred Dimpfel who planted electrodes in the brains of rats, gave them different drugs, and then would characterize the power spectra, so frontal cortex, hippocampus, striatum, and reticular formation and then separated these into six frequency bins and could do pattern recognition. And clearly, here's amphetamine, LSD, and MDMA. And although there's some similarities, each one is unique. And so it was possible to show that electrically, in the rat brain, they also were distinct entities, that psychostimulants were different from intactogens and also psychedelics. So most of the research chemicals target receptors or reuptake sites for monoamines. 
If we talk about the phenethylamine type, typically they're interacting with targets for serotonin, dopamine, or norepinephrine. And depends on the substituents on the aromatic ring, what type of pharmacology that you actually get. <clears throat> so we have the G protein coupled receptors, and this would include the serotonin 2A receptor, what I showed you earlier, these uh, seven transmembrane helices bound together, they couple to intracellular signaling. There are dopamine, uh, norepinephrine, serotonin, and cannabinoid receptors that are all members of this GPCR family. Then we have things that interact with tran uh, reuptake transporters. So after transmitters release from the nerve terminal, there are specific proteins that pump the transmitter back in to conserve it and reuse it. And we have transmitter reuptake transporters for dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. And things like cocaine block these transporters, so they can't transport at all. MDMA and amphetamine actually get inside their substrates for the transporter. Once they get inside, they displace the stored dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, and it spills out in a reverse direction through the transporter. Ketamine and some of the others interact with what's called an ionotropic receptor, a glutamate receptor, and I'm not going to spend any time on those, but that's the third type of target. So the research chemicals typically hit either this or this, the psychostimulants and the tactogens principally are interacting with the reuptake transporters, and the psychedelics and synthetic cannabinoids are principally interacting with a GPCR, G protein coupled receptor. In terms of preclinical characterization, uh, we work with a lot of these in the lab. Hallucinogens have affinity for serotonin 2A receptors, and in drug discrimination in LSD trained rats, we get generalization. So that is the rats thought we gave them LSD if we gave them something that uh, had the characteristics of a psychedelic. Psychostimulants, you look at an animal, if you give a psychostimulant to a rat, it increases its locomotor activity. That is, it scurries around a whole lot more, its activity increases. <clears throat> uh, they're also self-administered, amphetamine, methamphetamine, and other psychostimulants. You can train a rat to administer a drug to itself, like an intravenous drug user uh, of methamphetamine, for example, in humans. Rats will learn that too because psychostimulants produce reward qualities. They like psychostimulants. Rats love cocaine. They love methamphetamine. You can train them to self-administer it by putting a little catheter in their body and they have a lever they can press and they'll give themselves injections. <clears throat> it also, they also produce something called condition place preference. So if you administer a psychostimulant to an animal in one chamber and you give it to him there for several days, and then don't give him anything, and there are two chambers, he'll prefer to be in the chamber where he got the rewarding psychostimulant, and they increase extracellular brain dopamine. So the psychostimulants principally are activating dopamine pathways in the brain. And tactics have a pharmacology that's similar to psychostimulants, and nobody's really figured out all the things that they do. One of the projects I took on back in the early 80s was to try to develop an MDMA-like compound that might have legitimate origins instead of sort of coming from the street scene with the idea it could be developed into a medication. It quickly became evident that that wasn't going to be possible because MDMA does a lot of different things. And you couldn't simultaneously optimize all of those things at the same time in one molecule. But they have an effect that's similar to the psychostimulants in that they increase the release of uh, norepinephrine and dopamine, but uniquely they're much more potent in affecting serotonin. <clears throat> They increase serotonin uh, extracellularly, and they produce, a, if we train rats with MDMA, the intactogens will substitute in those rats. These are just some typical uh, phenethylamines showing their affinities. Mescaline is the least potent. The affinity is 1,500 uh, nanomolar. Um, here's a 2CT7, 2CB, 0.9, 2CT2. Uh, here's bromofly, a compound we made in the lab, 0.27. TCB2.7. Uh, These are very potent compounds. Bromo dragonfly, which is not on here, but which has this structure with some double bonds, is really much more potent. So anything that activates the serotonin 2A receptor, we probably classify as a psychedelic. That would be its principal effect. The psychostimulants increase locomotor activity. So this is what happens if you have a box that has photobeams that go across in two different directions, and you put a rat in. And you don't give the rat anything. This is one rat. So every one of these lines represents him moving from one place to another in the box. We give him two milligrams per kilogram of amphetamine. Look at the way he scurries around in the box. So this is increased locomotor activity. Here's MDMA. Look, it also does the same thing. Now, it's not as potent as amphetamine, 
five milligrams per kilogram of MDMA, if you just look at it visually, you can see you're not getting as much movement, but it still stimulates locomotor activity. This is a paper we published some years ago, and you can block that with an alpha receptor blocker. Alpha receptor, people always talk about serotonin with MDMA, but MDMA releases dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. And this locomotor activity, at least, was related to its ability to release norepinephrine onto alpha receptors. So there are a whole bunch of cathinone-type stimulants, and I'm sure many of you have heard of these. Cathinone itself, methcathinone, these are controlled substances now. Mephedrone, which was called meow meow, which is also controlled. And a number of these others, uh, pyrovalerone, methylene doxypyrovalerone, if they're not scheduled, they will be shortly. And I've seen an action by the DEA to schedule all of these things that look like cathinones. They were sold as bath salts initially. You probably have all heard of them. Um, <clears throat> Names like Aura, Blue Silk, Bonsai Grow, Charge Plus, these are the ones I could find, White Girl, White Lightning, etc. But they do have overdose effects. These are not safe compounds necessarily. Um, agitation, tachycardia, hypertension, myocardial infarctions, cardiovascular accidents, renal failure, hepatic failure, seizures, hyperparexia, fever, hallucinations, paranoid violence, rhabdomyolysis is the destruction of muscle tissue, and death. So these compounds, they come out and they sell them as research chemicals and say, oh yeah, this is good stuff. And there have been people that have had severe and even lethal consequences to the use of these. Um, here is a guy that was the music producer of the program Office, uh, died at the age of 53 in August of 2011. Um, the, he, the Office producer died of a heart attack after taking an, an, a party drug known as Meow meow, and you've all heard of that, this methadrone. Now, he had cardiovascular disease to begin with, so he wasn't what we would say properly screened, right? But this can happen to people that don't know or shouldn't be taking these. So these are, these are stimulants. They release norepinephrine. They can cause vasoconstriction. They can stimulate the heart, cause tach tachycardia. So people are taking these without understanding like what the consequences could be. <clears throat> so how do intactogens differ from psychostimulants? Because they're actually fairly similar. <clears throat> if we use MDMA as the prototype, they do more than produce CNS stimulation. We know, we know that. They have relatively low dependence liability, where psychostimulants can produce dependence and addiction. Uh, we don't see that typically with people who use ecstasy. And psychostimulants primarily affect the norepinephrine and dopamine uh, systems. Mephedrone, for example, uh, works like cocaine. It blocks the reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine into nerve terminals, whereas intactogens have a major effect on serotonin systems. Intactogens do resemble psychostimulants in that most have cardiovascular side effects. They increase blood pressure and can increase body temperature, depending on the dose. <clears throat> so this was a study we did some years ago looking at uh, MDA, MDMA, and MBDB which is an intactogen derivative that we made to look at the effect on serotonin and dopamine. So these are slices from rat hippocampus that were pre-incubated with tritium-labeled serotonin, dopamine, or norepinephrine. And we have a superfusion stream dripping over the slice, and then we put the drug in and we see whether the radioactive compound is released. And what you see is with MDA, which is a mixed psychedelic intactogen, you see a fairly dramatic release of serotonin you see a lesser release of serotonin with MDMA. And with MBDB, the addition of this, converting this methyl into an ethyl, you get a further attenuation of the ability to release serotonin. But they're all pretty potent in releasing serotonin. If we look at dopamine, you see a somewhat different profile. So MDA is a very potent dopamine releaser. MDMA gives less of a release, and MBDB has almost no effect on dopamine. And we were basically trying to discover what was the role of dopamine in the action of MDMA. So we made this MBDB as a probe that had less of a dopaminergic effect. <clears throat> but the effect on extracellular dopamine in nucleus accumbens was something that was also very interesting. The nucleus accumbens is an area of the brain where dopamine plays a major re uh, role in producing reward, the, f the feel good that you have uh, when something is very satisfying. You eat a good meal. Uh, it, wow, it's a great meal. You have great sex, um, or you, you take a drug that produces addiction or dependence. 
it stimulates dopamine turnover in the nucleus accumbens. And now if we look at MDMA, we see we have a fairly significant effect with MDMA, but MBDB has no effect at all. MMAI, which is an analog we made of MDMA, has no effect at all. And fenfluramine has no effect. So MDMA and MDM MDA, you'd see the same thing, affects this reward quality, this feeling good, makes you feel euphoric kind of effect, whereas these other analogs don't. They are more focused on just the action of serotonin. <clears throat> so when we train rats to discriminate MDMA, it turns out that the principal thing that they were discriminating was the release of serotonin. And this is what got us into trouble with a lot of these drugs. This first compound, methylthioamphetamine, was marketed in tablets that were actually called flatliners. And six people died from taking flatliners. Now, I don't know exactly how or the circumstances. My guess is that they took it and nothing happened, so they took some more and nothing happened, and they took some more and nothing happened, and because it doesn't produce effects like MDMA. But it also has the unique property that it inhibits the monoamine oxidase that breaks down serotonin. So people who took MTA kept taking it, it kept releasing serotonin, and as they took more, it blocked the enzyme that broke down serotonin, and they had what's called a serotonin syndrome. Uh, uh, confusion, delirium, a high body temperature, um, a rhabdomyolysis, hyperthermia, and so they died. Why did that material get taken? Because we had MDMA-trained rats trying to understand what the rats were perceiving, and this was the most potent compound that we made in producing that discrimination in MDMA-trained rats. So these are sorted by potency in terms of their ability, uh, IC50 inhibitor of synaptosomal uptake. They're sorted by the ability to block the reuptake of serotonin. So we have MTA, parodoamphetamine, some MDA analogs, MMA, MMAI, MDA, MDMA, MDA, MBDB, and amphetamine. And you can see amphetamine is very weak in affecting serotonin, but some of these others are very potent. So we publish these papers and say, the rats, it's substituted for this compound in MDMA-trained rats. The people who are reading this literature didn't realize, well, it's not just serotonin, it's something else, so this must be a good compound. Nichols made a good compound, so they'd put it out and have people try it. <clears throat> and tactogens will also have actions on dopamine and norepinephrine, and this wasn't appreciated for a long time. If you look at the literature on MDMA, you see a lot of talk about serotonin, a lot of talk about serotonin. But serotonin, is that's one thing it does that's somewhat different, but these compounds also have effects on dopamine and norepinephrine. So here's MDA, MDMA, and MBDB. So here's uh, sorted by, I think, norepinephrine or dopamine potency. So now inhibition of synaptosomal uptake of dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. What you see is MDA or MDMA, they're modest potency in uh, blocking serotonin in the cortex, but also have reasonable potency in dopamine and norepinephrine pathways. MBDB, which has very little dopaminergic effect, you see it jumps all the way up to 8,000. MBDB never caught on as an illicit drug. It never caught on in the street market. You hear people talk about MBDB once in a while, and they go, I haven't heard about that for a long time. That's because it doesn't affect dopamine systems. It doesn't make people feel good. And I've had discussions with Rick Doblin. I said, I think MBDB would be a great drug for therapy because it doesn't make people euphoric, but it still has an intactogenic effect. <clears throat> um, we have some disagreement. He thinks the euphoria maybe is necessary. But this never caught on because it doesn't produce euphoria. So it's the dopamine component, too. So when people were mining the literature, they'd find the compounds we made that had high affinity for serotonin systems, but they wouldn't, didn't realize that if it didn't have the dopamine or the norepinephrine effect, it wasn't really going to be very satisfying as a recreational chemical. <clears throat> um, here's some other research chemicals. How do they work? So here's 5-iodoaminoindane, uh, uh, another one that got out, 6-APB and 5-APB. People have probably heard those names. Uh, we made these because we were interested in, if you look at MDMA, it's got a methylene dioxy. And we thought, well, which oxygen is important? Is it this one or is it this one? So in this one, this is 6-APB. 5-APB has the oxygen down here. So these got out. They have potency in the serotonin system, but some of these also have reasonable potency in the dopamine system. And I can't tell you subjectively how they compare, but people see these, they come out of the lab, they say, oh, this must be a good compound because it's substituted in MDMA-trained animals. The other thing that happens with serotonin, when serotonin release occurs, 
uh, it shuts down inhibitory GABA systems, and so you have more dopamine produced. So this is another component of the serotonin release, which amplifies the dopamine. And it amplifies it if you have something that already releases. So 5-iodoaminoindane releases some amount of dopamine, but in vivo, the serotonin release amplifies that. It disinhibits the dopamine system. <clears throat> so ring substituents determine pharmacology. And looking at the phenethylamines, basically this is the way you could categorize them. Um, all of these we could say some people would call entheogens. Entheogens seems to be a broad category that a lot of people use to cover almost anything. Uh, but basically the psychedelics would be uh, on this side and the intactogens, the psychostimulants would be here. Psychedelics typically have a 2,5-dimethoxy substitution on the ring. And that can be incorporated into rings like this. We still have an oxygen here and here, so this would be a member of the fly series of compounds, so-called. Uh, we can put double bonds in here, and they would be members of, in this case, the dragonfly series. So if you hear somebody say something about bromofly or bromo dragonfly, they're talking about these things because we envision the student who made these envisioned they looked like they had wings and so they could fly. And when he put a double bond in and made it more rigid, he said, well, we need to, it still needs to be able to fly, so we'll call it a dragonfly. But it's the, the oxygen atom here and here opposed to each other. And then something in this position, it can be all kinds of things. So Sasha Shogun exploited this. You can have uh, sulfur, um, uh, alkyl, methyl, ethyl, uh, propyl. You can have uh, iodo, bromo, all kinds of things. If it's hydrophobic, lipid-like in the four position here, and it's got the 2,5-dimethoxy, it's going to be a psychedelic. If it doesn't have that, if we don't, especially if we lack the 2-methoxy, but we have other substitutions over here, it's going to be either psychostimulant or an intactogen, depending on whether it has much of an effect on the serotonin system. <clears throat> so substitution determines pharmacology. So what pharmacology will this compound have? Anybody? If I say it's 2CT7, what will you say? Anybody? Psychedelic. Why? Because this orthomethoxy is a principal determinant of psychedelic activity. Take that off, it's not going to be a psychedelic in most cases. Okay, this is a methylone. Everyone knows what this is? Stimulant or intactogen. We don't have the orthomethoxy, we've got the methylene dioxy. Okay, what about this compound? Psychostimulant, intactogen, or psychedelic? Any guesses? Stimulant, psychostimulant. We don't have anything substituted. This is for methylamphetamine. So alkyl groups over here, fluoroamphetamine, methylamphetamine, will give activity as a psychostimulant principally. What about this? Stimulant, intactogen, psychedelic. Psychedelic. Even though this is part of a ring, we still have the oxygen. That oxygen serves as an acceptor of a hydrogen bond in the receptor. So we know that. So we've still got the 2,5-dimethoxy, and in this case, we have an ethyl. If you took this off and it was just a methoxy, that compound would be known as 2-CE. Many of you have heard of 2-CE. So there's a rhyme behind all this pharmacological classification. There's a, there's a method for understanding it. <clears throat> I briefly want to comment on synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, I haven't done any work on synthetic cannabinoids, but there are a lot of them out there, and they're being scheduled as quickly as the DEA can identify them. <clears throat> so here's tetrahyd delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, a natural compound, safe compound, an overdose deaths, benign, despite being Schedule 1. So these compounds were early on made as synthetic cannabinoid ligands in studies of the cannabinoid receptor. The cannabinoid 1, the CB1 receptor, is the most widely expressed G protein coupled receptor in the human brain. That's a lot of receptors in there. So these all have high affinity, and they're synthetic. <clears throat> now, are they safe? So now we have synthetic cannabinoids that have come out. These are the uh, JWH compounds, spice smoking mixtures, if you've heard of those, K smoking mixtures. These compounds don't look like THC so much, but they have the same effect. The problem is some of these compounds are toxic, and they're just finding out about it because they've never been tested. There's no toxicity. So these things sometimes are hundreds of times more potent than tetrahydrocannabinol, 
So if somebody mines the literature, they make a gram of the stuff, which is maybe enough to make 10 kilos of some kind of a grass that they put it on, and they sell it as a synthetic uh, it's a marijuana smoking mixture. People smoke it. Oh, this is cool. Marijuana is safe, so this must be safe too. Well, that's not true. And I had a graduate student that, that said something that was axiomatic that I'll reproduce for you here. Make one drug illegal, and a more dangerous one will take its place. If marijuana had never been made illegal, probably these things would not have appeared. People are looking for something to get high. Marijuana is illegal. Well, these are legal. Well, they're not legal for very long, but they're legal, so they smoke them, not knowing what the long-term health consequences could be. <clears throat> so I'm going to finish up with this slide. One of these should make you feel better. Be sure to let me know which one it is. Um, I went through that fairly quickly, but I wanted to talk about research chemicals because the big problem with research chemicals is we don't know anything about them. You take them, you're doing an experiment on your own body, and uh, you don't know what will happen. The 25i in bohm compound, an attorney called me from North Dakota months ago about this young kid, 19 years old, had given some of the pure material to two of his friends. They overdosed and died. Um, he's in prison now. So these things, if you have access to these, you hear people talk about them, please be very careful and circumspect because nobody knows anything about these. Some of them may ultimately turn out to be very dangerous and with the best of intentions, you may be injured or one of your friends may be injured. So I just bring that caution out. So you want to be a researcher? Begin with a research protocol in which the rationale for using a hallucinogen is clearly described in detail. My son's an associate professor of pharmacology at LSU in the medical school, and when he started there, he wanted to work on hallucinogens, and he wrote a grant and sent it to me to look at it and had all this stuff about understanding the mechanism of action of LSD. I said, Chuck, nobody in the National Institute of Drug Abuse gives a shit about LSD and the mechanism of LSD. You need to rewrite it, take that out. If you want to use it as a tool somehow, fine. So if you want to get, do research in this field, you have to find a compelling reason to do it treating dying people, treating PTSD. But you have to find a good reason to do it because it's a long uphill battle to get to the point where you can actually use these. Second point, you've got to get lots of background information. So you can't just say, well, I think this will work. You have to document the literature. Is there a reasonable basis for that to work? And the BOL story is amazing because knowing what I know about BOL, it's a real shot in the dark. Even though it's an LSD analog, it doesn't do what LSD does. To, to find that was really amazing. Very fortunate circumstance. It's not real. It is an LSD analog, but it doesn't have an LSD-like effect. So make sure you've got a good background unless you're really lucky. Why are you interested in doing that? Are you a, a masochist? <laughs> um, what do you hope to learn? Well, the Hefter Institute, our mission is to try to improve the human condition. But you may have to have something that's more immediate than that, treating some illness and disorder, at least the medical model that I would say we use. So what are you, why are you doing it? Why are you going to start out in this road? Because the quickest way to kill an academic career is to do research in psychedelics, unless you really know what you're doing. Consideration of risks and benefits. The FDA is going to make sure that that's pretty clear, that you're not going to do anything that potentially could harm someone. Above all, do no harm. That's sort of the motto at FDA. Uh, is there a medical indication or an unmet medical need? You saw cluster headaches, uh, distress and anxiety in dying people, PTSD, alcoholism, substance abuse. There are compelling reasons to study these. You need to create a protocol that describes why it's compelling, why you're uniquely qualified to do it, why you have the facilities to do it, and so forth. Is there a scientific precedent for what you wish to do? When the Hefter started using uh, psilocybin in studies, we knew that LSD had been used very successfully to treat terminal patients years ago. Eric Cast had first shown that. So we had a reasonable belief that a psychedelic would work, although we didn't know if psilocybin would work, but we knew LSD had worked. So there was a scientific precedent. We thought we knew that this might work. And that would have to be part of the protocol. Before you get it approved, you would have to say, well, is there a precedent? Uh, approval of the protocol by the local institutional review board. And that's easiest in an academic institution. If you want to create a private IRB yourself, and MAPS has had to do that, I think, in some occasions, it's more difficult. I was on the Institutional Review Board at Purdue University. It has not only uh, academic people, but outside people. We had a priest. We had a woman who was a local realtor. We had a couple other people that were 
advocates for prisoners and so forth. So they look at it and say, should this be done? Is this ethical to do this? Do the subjects have proper safeguards? Is anybody going to be hurt? Can you keep the records confidential because nobody can, their names can't be revealed? So you have to get IRB approval. That can take some time. Uh, when Charlie Grobe did the first study, it was quite a hassle. When Rick Strassman did his DMT study, he really took some effort to get the IRB approval because back then they thought, oh, you're going to give psychedelics to humans. That sounds pretty dangerous. It's a little easier now, but you still have to get approval. And if you would decide to do that and could do it, you could certainly contact either MAPS or Hefter, and, and we could give you ideas of uh, sample protocols and so forth. Uh, you have to maintain subject confidentiality in any research study with psychedelics or anything. And also a license to use a Schedule I substance. Uh, even if you have less than one human dose of a scheduled substance, you still have to meet the same regulations that someone would meet if they had 100 grams. The same regulations. And Steve Ross told me they're doing uh, treatment of terminal patients at uh, New York University. They have, I don't know, a gram of psilocybin. It's not a lot. And the DEA guy came in. They had to buy a 10,000-pound safe. And every day, two people have to take it out, weigh the psilocybin, and both of them witness that the same amount is in there that was in there the day before and that nobody's pilfered it. So the DEA, the regulations, uh, can really be impo imp imposing. And uh, they're not in any hurry to grant you a license. So you may have... Your facilities improve. You may have the 10,000-pound safe. You may have everything under proper security, and you're qualified. And you've got approval to do your study. And then DEA will take their time, six months, a year, a year and a half. My son was just trying to get a license, and he called and said, I don't understand why I want my license. Oh, we lost your paperwork. Well, we, we can't find the paperwork from when we inspected your facility. Well, he had to call, and they told him that. Well, they came back out and re-inspected. It was another couple months. So you've got to get a license, state license and a federal license. Protocol has to be approved by FDA. And again, their, motiv their, their motivation is above all do no harm. So they'll look at it. If you've got an IRB approval, the FDA is going to look more at drug development issues, but uh, they want to make sure that everything you do is safe. And then obtain pure drug or GMP certified drug. Um, I made the MDMA that Rick Doblin used, that MAPS used for years. I had a kilo and a half in my safe because I made a whole lot. Um, that's all been transferred to him. But without the MDMA, where do those studies go? Rick Strassman, if you read his uh, paper from uh, back in 1991, I think, when he talks about what he went through, the hurdles he went through to do the DMT procedure, <clears throat> he got to the end and nobody would make it. Everybody called and said, well, we either won't do it or we want thirty or $40,000. So I made his DMT for $300. Um, psilocybin, when Albert Hoffman first made psilocybin, he used a reagent that could detonate spontaneously. So when I started working on the synthesis of psilocybin because I wanted to make it more available for hefta researchers, my technician said, you know that reagent he's using, that phosphorochloride? That can detonate spontaneously. I'm not going to work with that. So we spent two years finding a reagent to put the phosphate groups on. Fortunately, Albert didn't blow himself up. But... Um, so we were able to make it. But you may know uh, David Nutt has a protocol now approved in the UK and has a 500,000-pound grant to study psilocybin and depression. But in Europe, they demand that even experimental studies, you must have GMP-certified material. A GMP lab has got all kinds of certifications. Their, their balances have to be recalibrated. Uh, they have to have a certain airflow. People have to wear hair nets. There's a whole bunch of regulations where you have to track things. You don't really need to do that on a small-scale study. Drug companies do that routinely. They make it in-house. It's all approved. They contract it out. But for a small investigator who needs a gram of material or two grams of material, it's absolutely out of the question to go that route. And so I know David Nutt and his group got an estimate to make some GMP psilocybin uh, recently, and they wanted 100,000 English pounds to make a gram. That's just outrageous. Uh, in this country, you can get a gram for $12,000. You can actually make a gram for about $1,000 without the paperwork. So basically, that's a, the other problem. So obtaining pure drug, maybe that situation will be improved in the future, but that's something to consider. And just to plug my own institute, the Hefter Institute, um, been around since 1993. You go to our website, you can see the things we've done. We've got, I think, 50-some publications. We've got the clinical center that Franz Vollenweider directs in Zurich. 
And over the years, we've uh, spent $3.4 million on the research. As a virtual institute, most of our money goes to research. We don't really have any overhead. So uh, we've gotten quite a lot done. And I think that's the last slide. I had lots of graduate students over the years, postdoctoral fellows. The National Institute on Drug Abuse funded my research for 28 years, and I got a one-year extension. So they were interested in how they worked, but not how they could be good things. But I have to thank them for funding me, because without their work, I wouldn't have been able to do anything. So thank you very much. <clears throat>
Mm. So that would be too simple of an explanation. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. Uh, first off, thank you for your time. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, when we were looking at the cathinone molecules, I couldn't help but to wonder, uh, considering how innocuous by comparison the plant form is uh, within the culture of Yemen, I just wonder what about its structure uh, do you suggest the toxicity and the psychotic behavior that's been observed? And by extension, um, what could we say about the um, inherent risk of the piperazine derivatives like 3-methyloxy and 4-methyloxy PCP and also methoxetamine? Well, the pharmacology of most of these just isn't understood. I mean, there were studies with, for example, some of the cathinones that were done years ago where they basically all they looked at was increasing uh, locomotor activity in animals. So the other, the off-target sites besides the reuptake sites, uh, it's hard to know. I mean, there are so many things they do, and we know so little about the molecules. So all you can say about a single molecule is, well, it increases motor activity, and if in humans it produces psychosis or it has some other effect, then it would require more investigation. And there just hasn't been much research on any of these. Hello. Um, so you talked a lot about serotonin. Um, That's good stuff. Yeah. So uh, the literature says that in the enteric nervous system, um, there's actually about 90% of the body's serotonin. It was in the gut, right. So um, I'm wondering, with this in mind, if your lab has found any data, um, subtle or drastic effects that these drugs have on um, gut function or feeding behavior, anything like that? You know, anecdotally, a lot of people tell me that, you know, when they take a psychedelic, they have to go to the bathroom and have a bowel movement. I don't know how common that is, but they do stimulate the gut. Um, so that would explain some of the GI things. I mean, the serotonin, if you read the MAPS bulletin, was discovered by, you know, it was initially discovered in the gut. And then they found it was stored in blood platelets, and so then they isolated it from that. But it's in the gut. It's in enterochromaffin cells in the gut. And when you eat a meal, they're activated. They release serotonin, and that causes the gut to contract. So to some extent, these uh, do that. When we first developed, when we first started working with the, I think it was the 2,5-I N-bone compounds, we were doing drug discrimination, and we had no idea that they were so potent. And my research associate gave injections to the rats, and she says, they all got terrible diarrhea. So she gave a lower dose, and said, all got terrible diarrhea. And gave even a, I mean, higher do, a lower dose, and gave even a lower dose. So she kept going up until she found the point at which they weren't having, and weren't defecating and having diarrhea. So in rats, they were very potent in stimulating GI. Hi, can you comment on an update on NNDMT and 5-MeO-DMT binding to 5-HT2A and the sigma-1 receptors? Is it both? Is it? We, we Apparently, have, there's multiple sigma ones now. Yeah, um, I don't think the affinity at sigma one receptors is probably high enough to be physiologically relevant. Um, Dennis McKenna published a paper years ago looking at the two A and one A affinity of those compounds. Nobody has gone back and done that with more modern technology, but my guess is uh, that the DMT is a two A. 2C, 1A agonist, and 5-methoxy DMT has higher affinity for the 1A receptor, and of course it's like, it's a little different than DMT, 5-methoxy DMT, but I think probably the 1A receptor plays a role there. And we made a compound that had very high affinity for the 1A receptor, and a couple people ended up smoking it, and it knocked them out for like two hours. Yes. And I, only, the only difference was we could see was that the 1A affinity was really high. I've done some, some electrophysiology, EEG, with acute DMT smoke, um, I'm impressed by how rapidly it works and how quickly the action is terminated. Do you have any uh, comments on mechanisms for the inactivation? Or? It, it's probably inactivated by monamine oxidase A. Hmm. Um, it's in the brain but also in the liver, and that, of course, is how ayahuasca works. The admixture with the beta carboline alkaloids blocks the MAO in the liver, so that allows it to survive first pass. But I think the, the short duration of action of DMT and 5 methoxy DMT is related to MAO degradation. Thank you. Yeah, I probably have to go because I'm supposed to see a screening of a movie in San Francisco. So, yeah, is it really important? I just have a quick one, actually. Um, I was wondering if you think that a regular, like, say, 200 microgram dose of LSD 
can have enough impurities to do damage to a person's body? Um, if it comes on a blotter, a small blotter, no. The thing about LSD that made it unique is people would uh, talk about, tell me they bought capsules or tablets of LSD, and I said, well, you know, capsules and tablets, you don't have no idea what's in there. People say, well, I got a, a window pane or I got a little blotter. Do you think it's LSD? For the most part, it probably is, and there's almost no impurity that you could put on there in sufficient quantities to, to produce an adverse reaction. So that was one of the things about LSD when it was on small blotters. You couldn't really get anything on there that would be uh, toxic. Thank you. One more question that it, I lived with this for 40 years. Is LSD stable at room temperature or does it break down? And if it does break down, because I've always known to keep it refrigerated or get fresh LSD when it came out. Does it break down at room temperature? Is there a shelf life for it being LSD 25 or does it crystal, by room temperature crystal break down? Crystal and LSD stored in the dark at room temperature, ambient temperature for 30 years is stable. I know that for a fact. <laughs> <laughs>